Brother Noel's text is going to be in John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. God and children, thank you for this day. Please help Brother Noel to have strength and wisdom and pray for him to um, get well. In Jesus' name, amen. I really was. How old are you, young man? Four? And reading the word and praying. That's wonderful. Well, Evelyn would like to be here with us today, but she is uh, in the orthopedic office over on uh, 32nd and McClellan. I just dropped her off there. And uh, I don't know, the doctor's name is Twist. And uh, not Twist, <laughs> but it's close enough. <laughs> and uh, I'll be going, uh, they're having a consultation right now on if and when uh, we have to do uh, surgery. She took a real bad fall on the in our driveway, she was out doing some gardening and uh, got tripped up in the tiller and went down right with full force on her right knee. So it's kneecaps broken pretty badly and she is in a lot of pain. I do appreciate the prayer, appreciate that song we just sang. The last verse, the great physician heals the sick. So I'm claiming that promise uh, for her. Martin Luther said that uh, John 17 should have been written in letters of gold. He never said why, but I think I know why. It's the prayer of a king. And in this prayer, Jesus asks a special blessing on his disciples in verse 17. In the New American Standard, it says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. The amplified version, sanctify them, that is purify, consecrate, separate them for yourself. Make them holy by the truth. Your word is truth. The New Century Version, make them ready for your service through your truth. Your teaching is truth. You and I live today in a rotting, reckless, and rebel culture that completely rejects the concept of absolute truth. But to hear truth and not accept it does not nullify it. Churchill said, truth is incontrovertible. Panic may resent it, ignorance may deride it, malice may distort it, but there it is. <laughs> I believe Isaiah described our sorry situation today in Isaiah 59, 14, when he said, justice is turned back, righteousness stands afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. The voice translation says, for truth stumbles in the public square, and honesty is not allowed to enter. The message says truth staggers down the streets. These are word pictures. The Living Bible, truth falls dead in the streets. Now Isaiah 59 begins with this insight and indictment. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And he describes this sorry situation in verse four. No one calls for justice, nor does anyone plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. Now these inspired statements from God's holy word, truth has fallen in the street and nor does anyone plead for truth, 
are as true of current America as they were of ancient Israel. James Farrell said, one of the deep guilts in our present civilization is the bad conscience so many people have about the truth. They simply cannot handle the truth. But Jesus placed the highest premium possible on truth, and that's because he was and is and forever will be the truth. The word truth appears about 216 times in the Bible. That's in the New King James translation. Almost equally divided, 112 times in the Old Testament, 104 times in the New Testament. But it is in the Gospel of John from which we have read this morning that the word truth is used more than any other book or any other writer in the New Testament. 23 times alone in the Gospel of John do you find this word truth. For example, Jesus was full of grace and truth. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And those who do the truth come to the light. And true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. And here's good news, and you shall know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Why did the Jews seek to kill Jesus? Because he was a man who told the truth. Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus came into this world to bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth will hear his voice. So I want you to hear his voice today on truth from John 17. First of all, let's elicit the big question, the $64,000 question. In chapter 18, Pilate will ask that big question. What is truth? Quid ist veritas in Latin, which he spoke, which Jesus understood. What is truth? But Jesus had already answered that question for Pilate and for everyone else through all ages and all time and eternity when he said, I am the truth in chapter 14 and your word is truth in chapter 17. I try to post something on my Facebook page every day that's spiritually challenging and several weeks ago I, I posted this. The world is suffering from truth decay. Not tooth decay, plenty of that. But the world is suffering from truth decay and the church may partly be to blame. The late Francis Schaeffer said, here is the great evangelical disaster. The failure of the evangelical world to stand for truth as truth. And there is only one word for this, said he, accommodation. The evangelical world has accommodated to the world spirit of this age. Now I believe, and I know that you do too, that we must today, as never before, and now more than ever, stand for the truth. And Jesus is the truth, and the word of God is the truth. No apologies no accommodation. During the Civil War, James Russell Lowell wrote that long, famous poem that inclines, includes these two lines, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide in the strife of truth and falsehood for the good or evil side. The world has made its decision the church needs to make her decision. Now here are seven basic things you need to know about truth. And I, uh, uh, I took part of this from Bill Muhlenberger's blog, Culture Watch, where he is basically paraphrasing Norman Geeler's entry on truth in the Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics. Seven things you need to know about the truth. You might wanna jot these down, number one, Truth is universal. Truth is something true for all peoples, all places, all times. Different cultures, different historical eras, different nationalities do not change what the truth is. 
Number two, truth is absolute. It is not relative. An absolute is needed for standards. And there can be no standards without absoluteness. Indeed, there can be no measurement without absolutes. A builder knows that he wants a certain number of pieces of lumber, all the exact size, he will use one piece as the standard for the building of that house. Number three, truth is objective. It is independent of the knower and his consciousness. It is not based on subjective feelings or personal opinions. Truth does not reside in us or in our opinions. Personal experience is not the basis of truth. Truth is something that is external to us. We discover the truth that already exists. We don't make it up or create it. Number four, truth corresponds with reality. It corresponds to the way things really are. Truth is what corresponds to the actual state of affairs being described. Number five, truth is based on God. God is the basis of truth. Only God provides an unchanging universal reality upon which all truth is based. Number six, truth is personal. Truth is more than just abstract theories and propositions. Truth is something that demands a personal response. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew root usually translated true or truth means something which can be relied upon or someone who can be trusted. We can trust God. We can always trust his word. God is real and God is right. Number seven, truth is knowable. I like this one the best. We may not know the truth exhaustively, but we can know core truth. And God has made us in the world in such a way that truth can be known. This is the wonderful, wonderful thing about the truth. That is, while the finite can never grasp the infinite, if the infinite takes the initiative and reaches out to the finite as God has done with us, then that infinite truth can be known at least to some extent, at least enough to save our souls. So with this firmly in mind, let's recognize what I call Secret Agent 1717 as the powerful and transforming, sanctifying agent in the life of the Christian. Number two, let's examine the context. Now in John 17, Jesus is praying for his disciples, specifically verses six through 19. He makes several requests of God. Number one, he asks God to protect them by the power of his name so that they may be one, Father, as we are one, verse 11. Then again, he prays for their protection in verse 15. Not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. You will remember that Jesus once told Peter that Satan desired to sift him. Indeed, all the apostles in the context to sift them just like wheat or grain. Do you ever just thank God for his daily protection from your being sifted by Satan? Because if Satan wanted to sift uh, Peter, he wants to sift you and I, the disciples of Christ today. Luke 22 verse 31 in the voice reads like this. Simon, Simon, how Satan has pursued you that he might make you part of his harvest. You know, God's word never changes and Satan's will, his evil will never changes either. He desires to make every one of you a part of his harvest. 
And that's why he pursues you on a daily basis. Know that the evil one pursues you, but the righteous one protects you. He protects you by the power of his name. That's why the name of Jesus is so powerful. Now, every day you and I face two very great temptations. Number one, and that is to imitate the world. And some people do a very good job of that, I'm sorry to say. They start thinking like the world, they start talking like the world, they start looking like the world, they start acting like the world, they are imitating the world. Number two is the opposite, isolating ourselves from the world, taking ourselves completely out of the world. And Jesus said, I pray not that you take them out of the world. These men have a great task to do, but that you protect them by the power of your name. In the verses that lead up to our text, Jesus prays for their protection. We don't need imitation. We don't need isolation. What we desperately need today is insulation in the word. Insulation, protection by the word. When you're in the word, you're protected by the word. If you're not in the word, you're not protected by the word. Every day we need this insulation and God has made it possible. So Jesus said, they are not of the world even as I am not of it. Sanctify, and that's the Greek word, which means to set apart for a sacred use. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. I believe that truth is the sanctifying agent, our secret agent 1717, if you want to just put that in your margin and remember that. Now, William Barclay on this verse says that this word sanctify or consecrate does mean to set apart for a special task, but he doesn't end there. He goes on to say it means to equip a man or a woman with the qualities of mind and heart and character which are necessary for that task. In other words, if a man or a woman is to serve God, he or she must have something of God's goodness, of God's wisdom, and of God's holiness in their life. Clearly, clearly, the Word of God, Scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is the sanctifying agent. The Word of God sets us apart for the service of God. Now, in verse 6 of John 17, Jesus praised his disciples, gave them praise for obeying your word. He said, they have obeyed your word. And he went on to say in verse 8, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They received them, and they obeyed them. No one is going to be saved or sanctified who does not accept the Bible as truth and then obey whatever it asks us to do. Here's a quote from the late A.W. Tozer, never went to Bible college, just studied the Bible himself and became a great influence on the life of many people. Here's what he said, salvation apart from obedience is unknown in the sacred scripture. Apart from obedience, there can be no salvation. For salvation without obedience is a self-contradictory impossibility what he called easy acceptance, Bonhoeffer called it cheap grace, both the same, easy acceptance has been fatal to millions who may have stopped short of faith and obedience. Thirdly and finally, I want to explore with you a prime example of some disciples who did joyfully accept the word. I just love it when I go overseas. I've been going to Poland since 1990. This year I went back over for the 25th anniversary of my first visit there. And by the way, as I speak today, 
dear Vera Bajensky, wife of George Bajensky, is being laid to rest. Faithful servant of the Lord, son of the late Russian preacher John Huck, whose father, uh, whose hands, uh, when Ivan Stefanovich Prokhanov died, he who led 4.5 million people in Russia to become Christians only. And when he died, he placed his hands on the head of John Huck and gave him his blessing to continue to preach the gospel in Europe, which he did. And now Vera, bless her heart, even as we speak. But whenever I preach in Poland, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, it brings me such joy to see the people drink in the word of God. People who really know what it means to treasure the word of God because they were without it for so long. We take for granted, don't we? I love the thrilling account of the church of the Thessalonians. We're gonna spend our time in Thessalonians for the balance here. Paul gave them high praise in chapter two, verse 13, when he said, we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as a human word, but as it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe. Chapter one, verse six earlier, he had said, you welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. I think it was John R. W. Stott who said, the Bible is God speaking. The Bible is God preaching. The Bible is God teaching. And because the believers in Thessalonica welcomed the word and believed the word and received the word, and joyfully accepted the word of God as it was indeed the word of God himself. Seven amazing things happened in their sanctification. Number one, their work was produced by faith. Chapter one, verse three. Number two, their labor became prompted by love. Chapter one, verse three. And number three, their endurance was inspired by hope. Chapter one, verse three. All of those in one in verse three. In verse six, number four, they became imitators of Christ, not imitators of the world, which is our daily temptation, but imitators of Christ. Number five, they became a model to all believers everywhere, chapter one, verse seven, because the Bible says, from them the word of the Lord rang out, just like a bell, rang out to the other regions. Number six, their faith became known everywhere, so much so that Paul said, we don't have to say anything about it. You could take a break, Given. <laughs> we don't have to say anything about it. This is such a wonderful testimony of the Thessalonians. And then number seven, their reputation became legendary. Verse nine, others reported, others were reporting how these people actually turned from idols to serve the living and true God. I love the church at Thessalonica. And here is something very amazing and astounding to me. It is a fact that the church of the Thessalonians was established in only three Sabbath days of scripture teaching sessions by the apostle Paul in a Jewish synagogue. He preached from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And the converts included some Jews, a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and quite a few prominent women, Acts 17, verse four. Opposition, however, was fierce, forcing Paul and Silas after only three Saturdays to leave town. And from Thessalonica, they moved on to Berea, and then to Athens, and then to Corinth, and then to Ephesus, and eventually, to Jerusalem. Now please, please do not mistake the reading this young Thessalonian church or reading into scripture 
what Luke records in verse 11 when he says, now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see what if Paul was true. Luke is not referencing the faithful church in Thessalonica. He is referencing the jealous Jews in Thessalonica who forced Paul's untimely departure, not those who joyfully accepted his message as the word. A lot of people misinterpret Acts 17 verse 11. Say, oh, the church in Berea, the people in Berea. No, no, no. That's not talking about the believers. It's talking about the unbelievers. The jealous agitators in Thessalonica followed Paul to Berea and stirred up things so much that he had to leave for Athens. But the church in Thessalonica stayed on and flourished. Now, the noted Bible commentary in our fellowship, B.W. Johnson, actually, did you know his name was Barton Warren? I didn't until yesterday when I did a little more research on him. But we've all used, how many of you have a copy of the People's New Testament with notes? You can still get it today. I'm surprised only a few hands. You need to get the People's New Testament with notes by Brother B.W. Johnson. He says in his commentary on uh, the book of First and Second Thessalonians that this congregation, which was founded in only three weeks, stood longer than any church in the New Testament stood until A.D. 1430, although Clark says 1431. The last bulwark of the Christian faith to withstand the Mohammedan Turks, what we would call Islam today. In fact, Johnson said that in his day, and so I went back and see when he wrote this commentary, he wrote this commentary in the years 1899 uh, 1890 and 1891. It was written over a three-year period of time. He said, in my day, half the population of Thessalonica are still Greek Christians. Remember, they said there was a great number of Greeks who believed, as opposed to Jewish people that made up one-fourth of the city's population and Muslims, which made up one-fourth of the population. Several years ago, I was teaching in Damo, India, and uh, Dr. John Anand, a very respected Bible teacher and translator, was sitting on the front row. And I was teaching that morning about how to write, how to write an article, how to write a book, a large book or a small book. And I happened to mention the story of how a church that was built on a three-week foundation of teaching lasted longer than any of the other New Testament congregations. And I said, you know, that would make a great story. I said, someone should write a small book, a monograph about this. And Dr. Anon, I can still see his face, got very excited, and he pointed his finger at me, and he said, you do that. You write a monograph about that. We need to hear this story in India. The Thessalonian believers are a wonderful example, and they're actually an extension of Jesus' prayer in John 17, 17, where he said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. They were sanctified by the truth of God's word. And they stood for the truth longer than anyone else we read about in the New Testament. That ought to excite us today. And so I say, may the word of God, which is truth, sanctify, that is dedicate and consecrate and separate everyone in this room for a life of long and lasting and fruitful service. And may the word of God, which is sanctified, which has been sanctified, sanctify and set apart you for service. And may it always continue to work in you who believe.
God bless you all.